Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and today we're going to get into an international economic topic. We will be graphing uh, an exporting and importing nation of steel, and from that we can then move on to tariffs, subsidies, and quotas in later videos. So our example uh, will be steel production. This is a primary commodity operating within the market structure of perfect competition and in terms of elasticity we know that the demand and supply curves for primary commodities are both inelastic. In 2019 world uh, total world crude uh, total world crude steel production was 1869.9 million tons. The biggest steel producing country is currently China. It states here that it accounts for 53.3% of world steel production. All right, so many countries importing their steel from this dominant exporter. Here we have the list of countries that produce steel. Again, we see that China's at the top, then we have India, then Japan, and the United States. But more importantly, let's look at the net exporters and importers of steel, which we can see here. So the top steel net exporters means that these countries are exporting more than what they're importing in steel. This is in 2017. So we can see that China's ranked number one, where they are exporting 60.9 million tons of steel. Number two is Japan, 31.2 million tons of steel, and then Russia, Ukraine, and so on. So we're going to use China as our example in this video and in future videos to illustrate tariffs, um, subsidies, and quotas. How about imports? The biggest importing nation, or I should say net importing nation, is the United States. So we can see that there's a degree of dependency in the US on an exporter like China. And we'll see that they both benefit from trade with each other. The United States imports 25 0.2 million tons more than what it exports to the world. So the U.S., a significant importer. Um, and then number two, Thailand, Vietnam, and the European Union. All right, so let's go ahead and graph um, why a nation would be importing or why a nation would be exporting a particular good or service. Again, using the example of steel. So the global steel industry has all firms worldwide producing steel and all firms worldwide demanding steel as an input for their production. So let's go ahead and illustrate that. I'm, and I'm making the supply and demand curve inelastic since this is a primary commodity market structure and we know that primary commodities have a PED and a PES less than one. So this is the uh, supply curve for the global economy. So I'll call that supply at global. All firms worldwide, regardless of which nation they're, they're in, contributing to the global steel production industry. And then we have all firms worldwide that are demanding steel as an input in their production. So we'll call that demand at global or the global um, demand for steel. The intersection of SG and DG sets the equilibrium price and quantity at point A. So here we have that price being set, and we're going to label this as the world price, price at world. All right? This is the world price that's being established in the global industry from all firms that are producing and all firms that are demanding steel. And that sets the quantity supply and demanded here. We'll call that quantity at world. As we saw in perfect competition, the industry sets the price that all firms must accept. So that creates a perfectly elastic price that all firms in every nation must accept. Okay, We've seen that in the perfectly competitive market structure. So again, we can label for this national economy and all the firms operating inside that national economy that this is the world price that they must accept. How does this nation know whether they should be importing or exporting steel? That depends on their domestic price. So let's illustrate the 
domestic supply and the domestic uh, demand. Here is the domestic supply. And I'll label that SD. So for supply in the domestic economy, all the firms inside this one nation that are producing steel. And we're going to have all of the firms that are demanding steel inside this nation. And they're demanding it as an input for their production. So here is the demand in the domestic economy or domestic demand, domestic supply. What do we notice? That the intersection of SD and DD provides an equilibrium at point B that is set above the world price. Okay. So we're going to call that price in the domestic economy and it's greater than the world price. We're going to see that that means that this nation should be importing steel because their equilibrium price due to their higher cost of production are too high. They don't have a comparative advantage. They don't have a competitive edge compared to other nations with lower costs of production. So if this particular nation, as we saw, the U.S. is the biggest net exporter of steel, if the U.S. was to open up to world trade, their firms would have to accept that world price. And many firms would not be able to operate at that lower price. So we're going to see that there's going to be a decrease in the quantity supplied in the U.S., meaning that many of these firms are going to shut down and exit the U.S. domestic and global steel industry. Okay. So the quantity supplied when this country opens up to world trade would be right here. Less than at this point. Now, perhaps I should also mark that point so we have a reference. Right, this is the equilibrium before real uh, free trade. I'll just call that Q1. So many firms will begin to exit the industry. Right? They'll shut down and exit because they just not competitive enough. Their cost of production too high. But these firms here, all along this portion of the supply curve, they can compete. They can produce and they can supply into the domestic economy. All right, they would not be exporting. What about demand? Firms that are demanding steel as a key input, they love the lower world price. They are happy with free trade. So the quantity of consumption increases. So we see an increase in the quantity demanded. All right, from Q1 to QD. Let's label some additional points, C and D. Okay. A quick analysis of this so that we can understand why this particular nation, the U.S., is importing. Now, remember, since QD here is greater than QS, there's excess demand, and that excess demand can only be satisfied through imports. So the amount between QS and QD is what is being imported into this nation, perhaps from China as the biggest net exporter. So this quantity is what is being imported into the U.S. Okay? All right, so one other thing to note. So this, the U.S. firms that are supplying along here are satisfying the demand along here, right? But these firms from this point to this point have to uh, import the steel to satisfy their needs at that lower world price. Okay, so let's go ahead and analyze this as we perhaps would on a paper exam. Now, one other thing to note, I should label that this is the price at world, which is also equal to the world supply curve. Okay, great. So as can be seen, we have two graphs, graph A representing the global steel industry and graph B representing a national steel industry, in this case, the United States. The global industry is composed of all firms in every nation that are producing steel. Thus, we have an upward sloping supply 
curve labeled SG for supply in the global economy, all firms that are supplying steel worldwide. Then we have the global demand that is downward sloping labeled DG, demand at global, all firms that demand steel as a key input. In this industry where SG equals DG at point A, it sets an equilibrium world price at PW and an equilibrium quantity supplied and demanded in the global economy at QW. That sets the perfectly elastic price that all firms in all nations must accept. So in graph B, when we look at a particular uh, nation, in this case the United States, and their steel industry within that particular nation, we can see the supply, the domestic supply, and the domestic demand. We have an upward sloping uh, domestic supply curve labeled SD. We have a downward sloping domestic demand curve labeled DD. And the intersection of SD and DD provides a domestic equilibrium price at point B labeled PD. And also sets the domestic equilibrium quantity supply and demanded at Q1. If the United States opens up to world trade, they will accept the perfectly elastic world price at PW, PW being price at world, which is also our world supply curve, and all firms in the U.S. that produce steel are price takers and will have to accept that price. Since the price at world is less than the domestic price, that would mean that some firms would have to begin to uh, reduce the quantity of their production and potentially uh, shut down and exit the industry. So we see a reduction in the quantity supplied from point B to point C or from Q1 to QS. Those firms from zero to QS along the supply curve have lower cost of production and can produce and generate producer surplus or profit up to point C. So the suppliers along here will be providing steel for those that are demanding a longer demand curve here. What about the quantity demanded at that lower price? We see that it increases from point B to point D or from Q1 to QD in accordance to the law of demand. There's an increase in the quantity demanded due to that lower price. All right? But we notice that the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity being supplied in the domestic economy, which means that this nation must import a quantity of steel between QD and QS. Thus, between point C and D, or from QS to QD, that is the quantity of imports coming into this nation to satisfy the quantity demanded at QD. All right? Perfect. So in the next video, we're going to illustrate what this would look like for an exporting nation. All right? If you have any questions, feel free to comment, and don't, for, uh, don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.